All right, so I, I do hope to, um, to actually address this topic today. Um, I'd first of all like to thank uh, everyone for the invite to be here. Uh, it's been a very interesting uh, meeting to be a part of, um, and I hope to work with uh, some, if not all of you, later. Um, but let's get started. So the first thing, just kind of this is what I hope to address today. So I really took to heart the email that was sent out um, in terms of discussing the frontiers as you see them. Also giving you a little bit of context about who I am and where I've come from. And then also just kind of in line with uh, presentations thus far, give an idea of what we're doing uh, in this field. So with that in mind, my uh, old uh, advisor used to say that first, for any presentation you're going to give, tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. So this is where I would love to get the most feedback. These are my, my observations and hypotheses for future study. So the first is that there's been this focus on interdisciplinary work. And I've been a part of, in my short career thus far, of a number of interdisciplinary projects. And it doesn't seem to be working. And I'll talk about more of these. This will also be at the end of the presentation, and we'll talk about them more. Um, second, and I think this is going to lead to a pretty good conversation um, considering what was said before, the cost of extreme events will be less as compared to changes in the operation and maintenance costs from changes to routine events. I think there's been a focus on extreme events, uh, which I think has been very productive, but I think it's time to start moving away from that. Um, third, knowledge of historical climate is actually heterogeneous across even very small installations, and thus knowledge of current climate vulnerabilities is as well. And so this kind of gets back into climate communication. How do we talk about these things? What assumptions do we go into these places with? Uh, fourth, given advances in the distribution and quality of sensor networks, it's possible to project exposure from afar. And this actually is just more in line with, um, it's a key component of vulnerability analyses. Um, and finally, fifth, climate model output is not very accessible to non-climate scientists. And I am a non-climate scientist. <laughs> um, so I wasn't sure if this question was directed to me because I haven't been working in the field very long, but I figured I would answer it anyway. So when I first started, I feel like well, I feel like there are two big movements that have happened in the last decade. Uh, one is within the research community, and that is that adaptation is no longer a four-letter word. When I first started, you weren't allowed to talk about it because it took away from the storyline of mitigation. Um, and this has been brought up before. Uh, second, climate science is sticking outside of the community. And that's not just the general public, but that's other fields. Um, Third, the term interdisciplinary is omnipresent, uh, but I'm not sure if the incentives have caught up. And as a young researcher, that's something we have to be very cognizant of. As established researchers, I think it's a different story. Um, and finally, climate model output is becoming more salient, and I'll define what that means uh, in a bit. So a little bit about me, and I apologize for writing small. Um, I was trying to just convey a sense of where I've come from. So I started in as an economist. I love economics, but I, uh, I had an advisor who suggested that given I want to do more applied work, I should look at it a public policy program. Uh, given the, um, at that time I was looking at international development and I thought that was going to be my, my field of study. Uh, and then right around this time, the economy was <laughs> crashing. So I went and took a three month position for the Center for Integrative Environmental Research uh, working for Matthias Ruth. Uh, we were doing a lot of work on urban areas and climate change, and we did a lot of dynamic modeling. So um, as Igor was saying, uh, looking, I was, I was doing a lot of the dynamic modeling, but we were doing kind of these vintage effects. Um, and so about a year into working at SEER, I took advantage of the fact that you could get a PhD for free if you work for the University of Maryland. So I decided to start that program. Um, and I chose a public policy program because it has its ups and downs, but it does allow for a lot of customization in terms of what you want to do. And so I decided that there were two things I wanted to focus on. One was econometrics, and the other was operations research. And so I've studied across a, a lot of different fields. Um, but I guess what I want to say is that uh, the focus of today's talk is going to be largely over here. So after I stopped working for SEER, I started working for the Pacific Northwest National Lab with Richard Moss. And so what we're looking at is kind of this vulnerability analysis. But even more broadly, how can we just incorporate more climate information into actual decision making? So um, I wanted to get back to this picture. So this picture was brought up earlier in the week. 
And it's a rather provocative uh, picture uh, because the assertions that were made about it. So the idea was presented that science, oops, sorry, that science is reaching out to the public. The, the decision makers either don't have the capacity or they just aren't aware or they're just not, they're not there to receive the information. I don't think that's an accurate presentation of what's actually happening. So here are two alternatives. One, uh, there is no bridge. We're on two separate islands. We have no idea what the other one's doing. Um, it's just science over here, decision makers over here. Uh, and yes, I do know that I could go work for Pixar with my Photoshopping skills after I'm done with this. Uh, the alternative model is that decision makers are the ones, in fact, reaching out, asking for help, but science is not, in, not taking that into account. So I would say that, and I apologize for dropping a lot of text on you. Um, I don't generally like to do this, but I felt pretty strongly about this issue. Um, I would say that it's actually, there's a disconnect between the supply and demand of science. And this is rooted in traditional views on the role and place of science in society. Um, it's been a long-standing assumption that research should be divorced from society in order to provide the maximal societal benefit. It's referred to as the loading dock approach, uh, the linear model. And it assumes that more science is always equivalent to more societal benefit. And it also assumes that decision makers are waiting for that information and that the right questions are being asked. So um, the point I really wanted to make here was just that, in particular, researchers do or have not understood the context under which decisions are being made. We're getting better. I don't mean to suggest that this is um, necessarily the case today. Uh, but this directly leads to research that the decision maker cannot incorporate. All right, so just a little bit of vernacular for the vulnerability assessment, decision support. Um, we generally say that information needs to be salient, credible, and legitimate. Um, salient, I'm sure most, if not all of you, have um, heard of this before. Basically, it needs to be provided at the proper temporal scale, so not aggregated too highly, and at the, at the right spatial scale. But beyond that, it also needs to have an understanding of the decision-making context. So it needs to have an idea, an understanding of the constraints. What, what control knobs do decision-makers actually have control over? Uh, it needs to have an idea of the opportunities. It needs to have an idea, it needs to have an understanding of the timing. If, if they're doing their planting in May and your climate outlook comes out in June, it's not of use. Um, we also say that uh, it needs to be legitimate, which is the information needs to be perceived as unbiased and it's having the interests of the stakeholder at heart and it needs to be credible, so accurate and verified. So then what's the answer? And Gossam and I actually had this conversation last night a great way to do it is stakeholder engagement. You, um, working with stakeholders, you identify the problems before you actually even do the research. You do the research, you have an understanding of what their control knobs are. Having a stakeholder engagement is an iterative process. It leads to legitim legitimacy, it leads to credibility. So, um, so then what do decision makers need? And I actually made some notes for this one because I just wanted to not forget anything. So, uh, long story short, it depends. Um, <laughs> and the problem. It, and the decision maker. Um, and, um, but their decision makers generally do think of uh, these problems in terms of thresholds. And thresholds naturally align with a lot of what we're doing. Um, and they're usually sensitive to small subset of climate variables. So they don't need the whole world model. They just need certain aspects of it. And, there's varying degrees of the, their own uh, sensitivity to these variables. So we've worked at places um, where they know down to the tenth of a foot of what flooding levels lead to damage. And so they want to know what is the likelihood that we're going to be above that threshold moving forward. Um, but then you have other groups that don't really know their threshold to that nth degree. So this is just an example of some of the work we've done before. Um, we've just taken uh, tie gauge data, uh, done some return period analysis, taking some digital elevation model data from LIDAR, done some analyses of how that space might flood, and then projected the information on top. And then moving forward, I think this is the second time today that Tabaldi is getting mentioned, but uh, she developed a method for um, 
projecting or calculating a return period at a future time. This does bring up the question that Danny's been alluding to all week, which is this is for a particular scenario given a certain set of assumptions. So you're subject to this issue of, well, what happens if that scenario doesn't happen? And it's a, it's a valid criticism, and we don't, we don't necessarily have an answer for it. But at the same time, visualizing data in this way does lead to very productive conversations with uh, stakeholders. Um, all right. So this is where I wanted to spend the bulk of my uh, remaining time. So research proposal design will need to change in order to facilitate truly interdisciplinary project designs. So I've had the experience of working with um, a lot of engineers over the course of my career. And when I first started, NSF was really starting to push this idea that we needed to have more interdisciplinary um, projects. And so what this actually meant in practice was that as a public policy or a social scientist, I was, we'd be brought in, they would have their meeting about whatever the engineering aspect was, and then we would have, we'd be, our, our section, whatever it was, it'd be stapled to the back. And, and I don't know if, if that has changed much. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and so I, I wonder, you know, it could just be a function of we need more time to really figure out how to do this. It could be, you know, we'd, we need time to work with each other. We need to write the papers before we write the proposal. We need to understand the capabilities of each other, all that kind of stuff. Or it could be that this is more systematic and that we need to think about how we produce these calls. Second, the cost of extreme events will be less as compared to changes in the operation and maintenance costs from routine events. So there's been this focus on extreme events in the climate literature, which has created a focus on spectacular events, the Katrinas, the Isabels, the Sandys. Um, and so we, what we've done is a lot of bottom up. We've, we've gone to very small installations and we've gotten to know their own sensitivities. And so when I say that the extreme events will be less costly than than the uh, routine events. What I'm saying is this. So we found, anecdotally, this is, we need much more research on this, but basically you're always adapting to the last worst event. And the more, so like one of the installations we're looking at, uh, they were hit by Isabel, $100 million worth of damage. But it wiped out everything. And so they didn't build what they had before. They built stuff that was nine feet taller. So that all the substations are off the ground. Everything is changed. Everything is changed that was damaged. If it wasn't damaged, it wasn't changed. So the next time, they've had a really bad decade. So seven years later, they were hit by another hurricane, and there was about $10 million worth of damage. Um, they changed some more stuff. Three years later, they were hit by another hurricane, and about a, a million dollars worth of damage. Now, all of these are very rough estimates. Nobody's actually tracking how much damages are happening, because everybody's just trying to fix it to get it back to normal. But I guess what I'm asserting is this. Um, because we're always adapting to the last worst event, that might not be the full story. But what's happening is they're so, they're so low, they're on the coast, that any changes to the distribution of water levels actually causes a very big change in the operation and maintenance costs of running the place, keeping it open. So for example, door dams. Door dams are their ad ad adaptation option that they've implemented. It costs about $10,000 to deploy them. Right now, they deploy them four times a year. It's $40,000. We've done some back of the envelope math that suggests, you know, using the Tibaldi results, they might be deploying door dams 200 times a year in the future under certain scenarios. It's $2 million that they don't have. And so, and that's just direct cost. That's not indirect cost. That's not the fact that if you have door dams on a building, and that's only one building, you can't use the building. You can't get into it. It's probably a safety hazard to have meetings in there while the water is up. Um, and so these are things that, um, that we should think about. All right, and so I'll just quickly go through the last couple. Basically, um, knowledge of historical climate is heterogeneous across even small installations, and thus knowledge of current climate threats can be as well. And this has really stood out. Like across, it's, it's highly correlated with occupation. Um, and it can be, it's, in some of these locations, it's very transient. Uh, so we can't assume that they know what's going on. Educating people on what has happened is actually a, a big part of what we do. Uh, so given advances in the distribution and quality of sensor networks, it's possible to project exposure from afar. 
that's just my own assertion. We don't need to, to delve into it too much. Um, but lastly, great. Lastly, uh, climate model output is not very accessible to non-climate scientists. And basically what I'm saying is there's a really significant cost of entry to effectively using climate information. And for many of the projects we're working on, we have to have a climate scientist on it just to make sense of what's going on and make sure we don't mess up something very badly. Uh, and I, you know, when I was trying to think about how to make this presentation, it, with 15 minutes, there's a lot that's left off. And so um, all of this information that we were talking about before, oops. Oops. gone haywire. So it's at this point. This is, this is where decision support kicks in. So you're taking this information, and this is what Danny was getting into. It's how do you, how do you use this information? Uh, you know, how do you get this involved into decision um, support activities? And this is a whole set of literature right here. And so there's just not enough time to go, to go through it. But I, w I did want to ask a question. This is something that excites me personally, and I did wonder how many people in the audience know what this is and what it's capable of? One. This is, uh, it's called an Arduino. It's right there. Um, <laughs> it's similar to the Raspberry Pi. If you YouTube it, people are building amazing things with these things. But the thing that excites me most is these are wearable sensors. You can do all sorts of interesting, um, you know, as a social scientist, you can do all sorts of interesting projects with these. And they're less than $100. And so we're getting better. We're getting more efficient at, at extracting energy from the environment. The cost of computing is coming down. It's, everything's becoming wearable. Um, and so we should probably spend some time thinking about what if it's not NOAA collecting this data? What if it's me? You know, what if it's one of us? Like, we should probably have better data standards. We should probably have make sure, statistical techniques for all of these deployments. You know, there's a lot of work to be done with the decreasing cost of these sensor networks. I think that's it. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Questions for uh, Andy before we move on? So I, I agree with you that I think stakeholder engagement early on is, is a really good way to formulate the science. And you know, I've seen some good examples around resource management in the Western US, where Forest Service, National Park Service is doing this. But we were talking in the break. Um, Ian asked about scaling this up. So do you see that this is a scalable process um, in terms of, I mean, these can be very time consuming, um, expertise intensive in some sort. And so will these remain sort of isolated, um, you know, kind of incidents of convenience, or do you really see this as something that could really be grown and expanded? The stakeholder engagement process? Well. You, you mean the stakeholder engagement process itself? Um, I, think if you, I think if you do it by decision context, that it actually won't be that large. Um, so for example, um, they recently convened one for water resource managers. Uh, so it tends to be. The topic itself, I think, tends to limit the size of, uh, of these things, and, and thus the cost of organizing, though there is a tremendous cost to putting these things together. But if you think about it, it's more of a front end cost. You know, Once you have these relationships, once you have these groups, the cost goes down. Okay.